Avatar the Video Game. Have you heard of it? I bet you haven't even heard of it, you uncultured piece of sh- Sorry, I, I came in a little hot there. But I got this ulcer on the inside of my lip right now and it hurts like a motherfucker to talk. People have heard of the Jordan flu game. People are gonna be talking about the bro juice ulcer video. <laughs> Avatar is one of the best animated series of all time and Netflix just released their live action show. So I thought it'd be a good time to go back and take a look at the original game for the PS2. Avatar The Last Airbender was the first game in a line of three by THQ. The story fills the gaps between books one and two, and to my surprise, it actually wasn't horrible. Now don't get me wrong, it was by no means good, or fun, but at least it didn't make me feel sick, like a certain movie. Like I'm convinced the writers had to be like huffing spray paint on their lunch breaks, like PB&J with a side of Rust-Oleum, tried winning an award by copying Spongebob, you know, fucking smashing their head with a hammer. I just refuse to believe that anybody outside of a psych ward could have written that movie. Their willingness to spit in the face of fans of the show is crazy. It really is just a bad movie enthusiast wet dream. Not that I know what like a wet dream is or anything. I just heard about it from like non-sex havers, which I am not because I do have a lot of that. Now, when I first saw the game, I figured it would just be a shitty platformer, just like 90% of the other licensed games out there. And turns out, I was completely wrong. It's a shitty action RPG instead. Shitty might be a little bit of a strong word. This game's really not as bad as I thought it would be. I was kind of taken by surprise by the first cutscene, not really because the visuals were really nice or anything like that, but because somehow they got the voice actors from the animated series to reprise their roles for the game. Katara said she would go penguin sledding with me before training. I don't know how they got them. I mean, they probably threw a giant check at them or put a gun to their head, but however they did it, I mean, I'm glad they did. Although admittedly, I was pretty excited to hear the wish.com version of Aang, complete with wrong pronunciations and everything. My name is Ong. But it was nice to actually hear the real voices. Now, those voices are spouting hot garbage for the most part, but it was still pretty cool. The animation looks very PS2. They went for a cell shaded look and it turned out okay. I mean, the character models look pretty similar to their TV series counterparts, besides the dead look in their eyes. Now, the one thing personally for me that I couldn't get past are the wacky Tom and Jerry stock sound effects. See you later, boy. It just feels like some old, out-of-touch sound engineer heard the game was based on a cartoon and thought, oh, it's just like that Bugs Bunny fella I saw at the theater. But overall, it's not the worst-looking game I've ever seen, especially for a game that came out on the PS2. I mean, Quest for Balance was just released on the PS5, and honestly, I can't tell much of a difference. Although I think that says a lot more about how shitty that game looks than it does about this game looking good. Like I said before, the game bridges the gap between books one and two with its own original story. It's not canon, of course, but it was refreshing to see a licensed game that didn't just follow the show or movie it was based on. We start our journey in the Northern Water Tribe. Katara gives you instructions to go talk with Master Wei, which is something that you're going to be doing a lot of. About 50% of the game is spent talking with NPCs, and most of the interactions with them let you choose your own response. And when I first saw that, I was like, oh my god, this is going to be an Avatar game with a branching narrative with multiple endings and player choices that actually matter. And then I remembered we're dealing with the publisher of the Polar Express video game. I understand licensed games make you a lot of money, but we got to draw the line somewhere. Even though the player responses didn't really matter, it was still pretty cool to see. But once you talk to Master Wei, you receive your tutorial quest. You need to go investigate an area and then report back. And that's really the main gameplay loop you'll see throughout the entire game. You get a task from an NPC, you walk across town to do that quest, and then backtrack to the NPC to finish it. And oh my god, the amount of backtracking in this game is sickening. I felt like Spongebob when he lost his identity, when he's turning his house upside down to retrace his steps. Like it took me around six hours to finish this game. That could have been cut in half if you take away the backtracking. But along the way to our quest location, we learn about Aang's distaste for PETA as you brutalize some wildlife, which just really made me feel like the Avatar. And this is our introduction to the game's combat system, which unfortunately isn't really that great. You have two basic moves, square for block and X for your basic attack, 
but each character has some special moves they can perform as well at the cost of mana with new ones being unlocked as your party gets stronger. And your entire party levels up at the same time, so you don't have to worry about grinding with each character separately, which is really, really nice here, because some of the members of your party aren't really as useful as others, but each party member does attempt to serve a specific role. Katara has some healing abilities that she can use on either herself or the team as a whole. Sokka does massive amounts of damage while up close. On the flip side of that, Haru is used to keep enemies at a distance. And finally, Aang is the most balanced that you'll see. And I found myself mainly playing as Aang, just because, like I said, he's the most balanced, and he was actually pretty fun to use. None of that really matters, though, because you can just run around all the enemies. They don't chase you, so you can really just skip all the encounters if you really, really wanted to. Each enemy does give XP when they're defeated, and that's the game's way of kind of discouraging you from skipping over all the enemies, along with random item drops. The enemies will sometimes drop items that you can use or wear or sell at the market. So you can skip over all the encounters, but those boss battles at the end of each chapter are just going to be a little bit tougher. There are plenty of side quests and collectibles to keep you busy, and you'll sometimes have to use a focus mode to uncover chests. And this focus mode takes you into a timing mini game, which at the start is actually pretty satisfying to do, but it becomes annoying pretty quickly. I just ended up not bothering with them towards the end of the playthrough. The rewards just weren't worth it. After the tutorial quest, our story is kicked off by the village being suddenly attacked by Zuko and the Fire Nation. Katar is captured by this powerful move. Ugh, brother, ugh, what's that? And taken away to a Fire Nation prison. Now it's up to Aang and Sokka to free her. And on your way to Appa, you run into your first boss, which appear at the end of each chapter. You defeat the boss, and then you're hit with the twist that will make the sixth sense look like Coco Melon. All right, here we go. Try and stick with me here, right? The giant machine that shoots fire and showed up during a Fire Nation raid was made by... It was, it was made by the Fire Nation. I don't know why they were so surprised by this. Like, you have to see that coming, right? Fire Nation! Things are getting more dangerous, Aang. But after our first boss fight, we fly over to the Earth Kingdom where Katara is being held. We do some quests for the locals and end up freeing Katara. While leaving the prison, the team attempts to free a prisoner called the Maker, who is being held and forced to create machines for the Fire Nation. But when they get to her cell, she's already gone. So the rest of the game's pretty much spent just hunting down this Maker and helping out villagers along the way. We visit an earthbending camp where Haru joins the party, make our way to Omashu, and finally to the Maker's secret island. She wants to use her machines to replace Benders, and then proceeds to absolutely fucking body Katara. And we know Aang's not gonna let his shorty be done like that, right? So he goes into the Avatar state and defeats her, and, and, and that's pretty much it. Now, like I said earlier, the game was actually pretty decent. It's nothing groundbreaking, and the RPG element isn't very in-depth at all. And that's fine. This is a game that's primarily marketed towards children. Like, you don't want it to be too in-depth. You'll turn their fucking brains into mush. Like, they're coming home from a hard day at school, right? They're probably eating glue and Play-Doh for the past eight hours. They just want to relax and, you know, have fun. And by the way, don't eat Play-Doh. It, it gets stuck in your teeth. Just swallow it like a real man. Avatar just needs the Hogwarts Legacy treatment at this point. Like, if they made an Avatar game right, like Breath of the Wild, but in the Avatar universe... I would spend so much time playing that game. I'm willing to bet a lot of you guys would spend a ton of time playing that game too. But yeah, I mean, that's all we got.